everyone, welcome back to the channel and today I'm going to be showing you some of the most common floor types which I use and specify on new projects. It's really important that you have a lot of different experiences using different floor systems. Every floor system will have its pros and cons and have its uses on different projects. Every project is going to be slightly different and have its own sort of unique constraints or requirements. Knowing which kind of floor system to specify to meet these requirements or to sort of combat certain problems is going to be really really important and can help the client save a lot of money and can actually determine whether or not your project is going to be successful or not. So the first one on the list is a beam and block floor and this is a precast system and it's very commonly used on the ground floor for residential buildings. When you can't use a ground bearing slab and you need a sort of suspended floor system because you don't have the ground conditions for it, a beam and block floor is a very cheap and fast alternative. It's not a very common system to use anywhere but on the ground floor I know it can be used on sort of superstructure floors, but I don't like to use it because I think it's a bit of a healthy health and safety hazard. Beam block floor doesn't have the best spanning capabilities for its floor depth, which is why I don't tend to use it on the superstructure regardless of the health and safety risks. The next floor system I'll use is going to be shallower and can span a lot further. So on to the next system, which is a precast concrete plank, and it's probably one of my most used and I guess favourite floor system to use. I like to use it because it's got a large span capability and it's reasonably lightweight and it's got a reasonably shallow depth to it as well. You can also increase its span capabilities by making it work compositely using a sort of structural topping over it. There are some things which you'll need to look out for when using precast blanks. For one, the pre-camber on it because it's pre-stressed can be quite high and the way that you counteract this is by applying dead weight and this can be either in the form of a screed or like I mentioned earlier a structural topping. You do need to make sure that you actually put enough dead weight on it to make sure that in the centre of the plank itself you actually have enough depth. The pre-camber is something which can be overlooked and I've been caught out by this when I was a junior engineer as well so just be, be on the lookout for it. Another thing which you need to look out for is the cranage requirements. On a site where you don't have a lot of space a precast plank is probably not going to be the best solution because you don't have a crane on site to sort of lift these planks in place. Another great feature of a precast plank is that you can design your steel beams to act compositely by using shear studs. The added work for welding these studs and the extra design time could be a well worth trade off. So another really common floor system which I'd use on a lot of projects is what I'd call a composite concrete metal deck and essentially what it is is a sort of permanent formwork made out of a profiled metal sheet and then you just kind of pour concrete over it. Similar to precast planks, you can design the steel beams to work compositely to sort of reduce your overall depth. Also, another great feature of these kind of metal deck systems is that you don't need to prop the slab up at all. You can opt to prop it to increase the span further, but I don't think it's really worth the trade-off by including all that extra time putting props up. I don't tend to specify this kind of floor system as much as I do precast planks, mainly because they can't span as far, so you need to put more beams in. Unlike concrete planks where you need a really large crane to lift the planks in place, the profiled metal sheets are actually very very lightweight and are very easy to sort of manual handle and to move them into position. This makes it great for working in tight spaces or working on refurb projects. Um, you can move the sheets in and you can move them around and then all you've got to do is just pour concrete and there's not a lot of like faff that you've got to do with it. Probably the most common concrete frame slab is going to be a flat slab. Compared to a sort of traditional two-way spanning slab with drop beams, a flat slab is so much quicker to construct that often contractors will often pay more in terms of volume of concrete because the speed in erecting all the formwork is so much faster that it offsets the additional cost for the extra concrete. It's very common in high-rise buildings when you're kind of repeating the same slab over and over again, so you're just reusing the formwork. I find flat slabs are very efficient when they're kind of spanning between 7 to 9 meters. Flat slab design can be a very complex topic and I find amongst engineers it's a very divided topic on what's the best approach on how to design a flat slab. It's really common to just build a sort of analytical model and then use the forces from that to design the slab but in reality it's actually a lot more complex than that. The parameters that you use to build the model can make a huge difference on the sort of output that you get. Also, how you extract forces from the model can be a huge difference on 
how you design this lab as well. I won't get into detail on how you design Flat Slab in this video, but it's definitely something I want to cover in a future video. So make sure you like and subscribe and smash that notification bell to get an update for when I do release that video. In short, Flat Slabs are a great solution with minimal depth, contractors, clients, they absolutely love it because of the flat soffit. What you do have to be very careful of is just how easy it is to fuck up the design and analysis of the flat slab. So if you're new to it, make sure you get it checked by a senior engineer. So a post-tension slab is basically a flat slab, but you're introducing the sort of pre-stressed or post-tension like tendons inside the slab to increase its span capacity. PT slabs are a great alternative to a traditional flat slab when you want to span a further distance whilst maintaining a sort of slimmer profile. The downside of PT slab is the extra design time and also the extra construction time to introduce all these tendons. A PT slab design is normally done more by a specialist than the normal kind of structure engineer. Contracting wise it's also more of a specialised contractor and it's probably going to be subcontracted by the main concrete frame contractor. This does mean that it can be more expensive, but this is why you need to know the pros and cons. Like, is it worth it to have a longer spanning, shallower depth slab, but you're gonna have to increase the cost of sort of design, the, the concrete, and all the sort of construction time? You just have to discuss the pros and cons with the contractor and the client, and then weigh up which is gonna be the right solution. So moving on to solid timber joists, and these can be found in like your own home, like old, new, traditional like housing projects. Timber joists are a very affordable and easy to work with material. Any contractor who knows even the slightest thing about building will know what to do with timber joists. Designing timber joists is gonna be really important for sort of junior or graduate engineers. It's kind of the first stepping stones for designing in timber. Once you've kind of grasped how to design timber joists, you can sort of move on to designing other bits of timber. And timbers are going to be a very, very important. Solid timber joists are so common in old houses that you really need to be very familiar with it, like the spacings, the sizes, you know, how it works, the grades of timber. It's all really, really important stuff, especially if you do a lot of refurbishment projects. On newer projects, you're probably less likely to specify a solid timber joist because of the new sort of engineering advancements. And I'll move on to this on the next floor system. So this leads on to the next floor system, which is what we call as eco joist or posi joist, or even easy joist. I think they're basically the same thing. It's basically um, timbers with an open web or an open steel web. Why these are preferred over solid timber joists for sort of new build homes is because of how far that it can span, and because they're open web, this is great for services to just go straight through them. If you're using solid timber joists, you'd either have to cut a hole through the joist or you'd have to go underneath it therefore sort of increasing your sort of overall floor depth. Using these eco joists you can run the surface straight through and therefore minimizing your sort of overall floor depth. I think the sort of biggest downside to eco joists compared to solid joists is the sort of the lead time. Eco joists will need to be designed by a separate engineer or designed by the sort of supplier or manufacturer and all this can really increase the lead time whereas buying solid joists you can just go down to your local like supply store and just get a load of joists there. But overall, I think these kind of joists are a great solution for you know spanning up to say even four to five meters very, very easily. Hopefully you found this useful. There are of course loads of other floor systems which you can choose to use. The ones I've listed are just the ones which I've most commonly used and specified. Anyways, please remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.